Hello everyone and welcome to this special video which um, I guess is now becoming a, a recurring theme of the channel where I'm gonna analyze um, the top some of the top decks uh, um, from the latest regionals from Athens regionals um, first I'll talk a little bit about um, how I did because I know a lot of people are wondering um, I went five wins one loss and three ties and honestly out of those three ties I feel like all three could have potentially been wins but I got some really weird and unlucky game ones um, where I either lost off of um, my opponents hitting like the right cards and me whiffing pretty early or simply because I prized to Glacian against Greninja now I did play um, Jolteon, Regiice, Glacian, Garbodor, which I will talk about at the end of the video as well. I will showcase the list and I will talk a little bit about the deck um, then. But yeah, that's how I did. I got 72nd place, so I bubbled out of top 64, out of money and out of the extra 8 points, which can actually matter for me in the Latin American region, but that's Pokemon for you. Um, really out of my control, I won the games I should have won. The loss was against Carl Citavi, who got top 4 with Vespig and Substrika, and it was honestly a really difficult matchup for the deck, because he did run Mew EX. So, I mean, if I had to take a loss, I would have taken that one. But the, the draws definitely left a bitter taste in my mouth, because one of those, had, the, had it been a win, um, I could have easily made it into day 2. But anyways... Um, the, the tournament was very exhausting, it lasted, um, day one lasted almost 15 hours because you had to be in line to register by 9, 9.30 a.m. and then the last round ended past midnight, a little bit like 5 minutes past midnight. So it was a really exhausting day for, not only for me but for everyone involved and I can't even imagine how exhausted the staff must have been after day one. And, but I mean, with the record-breaking attendance that Athens got, 682 players, I believe, um, highest attendance so far. Um, like, you, you have to expect that. Um, tournaments are getting bigger. Pokemon needs to do something about this. Um, there's been a lot of talk about going back to Swiss rounds, or rather, back to best of ones with extra Swiss rounds to compensate. Um, but still, half an hour rounds and everything would probably make things go a little bit faster. Um, you could also have um, bigger day twos, which I think would help alleviate a little bit of the luck factor that all of us, um, or a lot of us, experience rather. And yeah, um, the tournament itself um, was very interesting. The metagame was quite diverse, I would say. Um, Turbo Darkrai, the deck you have in front of you, was pretty much the dominant deck after it got a lot of hype off of League Cups. But, um, but. I generally saw, except Iveltal, I'm pretty sure I saw every single deck out there. Um, Iveltal was a minority, um, people favored this dark deck over Iveltal. And then at the top tables you had Greninja, you had Mega Rayquaza, which made a great showing, you had Vespiquen, which made a really great showing, because a lot of people were saying, including myself, or were thinking that Vespiquen Substrika would probably only be able to deal with Iveltal and not much else, or BD Veltal and not much else, maybe Greninja. But then this tournament clearly showed that in the right metagame, with the right list, and we're going to review a very interesting list by Dylan Bryan, the second place finisher, um, Vespiquen, even without Bile Compressor, can definitely still be viable. So, this is um, <clears throat> Chris Satyakas, Satyakas um, first place winning list, Turbo Dark, um, top 8 was comprised of Three Mega Rays, three Vespigons of Strika, and two Turbo Darks. Um, Chris ended up winning the tournament, and as you can see, um, I did feature this deck on on Monday last week, or rather this week. I don't know when I'm uploading this, but I did feature this deck on the channel. So if you want to see it in action, um, I definitely recommend you check out that video. And I don't know, I guess the video showcased maybe some of the weaknesses of the deck more than its strengths. So I'm going to talk about its strengths right here. Um, the deck is super consistent. Two baby Iveltal or Oblivion Wing Iveltal to recover energy and four Darkrai EX paired with one Hoopa and two Shaman. That's as consistent as you will get in this format. No evolutions, no Megas, no need for Spirit Links. 
a single ultra ball um, pretty much sets up your board for for the late game or for all stages of the game rather um, I guess early on you might want to use baby Veltal for a few turns but even if you don't baby Veltal is great for late game for um, for recovery and to play a seven prize um, a seven prize game so I mean you have six good starters three bad starters if you will some people chose not to run Hoopa but I feel like having the ability to just straight up go for two Darkrai and a Shaman on your first turn it's just really really good um, then everything else is like I mentioned pretty much uh, based on consistency you have the four Sycamore 3N to Lysander which is I would say the, the absolute um, minimum that you should run in any deck um, that should be like the base of your deck along with the four verse seeker and four old trouble I mean unless you're using Greninja you probably want to run um, you probably do want to run these 17 cards a hundred percent for sure um, the tech supporter choices such as Pokemon Center Lady such as X Maniac and such as um, Team Flare Grunt. Now those are either up to the deck, um, you use those to maybe compensate for something that is lacking, such as Ability Lock um, through Hex Maniac, or something that it really needs to execute its strategy. Um, or even further disrupt your opponent by using Delinquent or things like that. Um, in this case, the Pokemon Center Lady is really great because there's really nothing out there other than Mega Ray, I guess, that can potentially one shot at Darkrai X. Even Mega Mewtwo has a trouble um, one hit KOing to vote or rather Fighting Fury belted Darkrai EXs. So um, Pokemon Center Lady turning two hit KOs into three hit KOs is very important. And then you have Hex Maniac and Silent Lab to have some sort of control against Volcanion, which you desperately need with this deck. And then finally it also helps with Greninja. And then you have the Team Flare Grunt for added disruption throughout the game. Um, after this we have the three trainers mail which is also pretty standard now some people were choosing not to run trainers mail I think we are all back on the trainers mail train um, then four max elixir which is pretty much what makes this deck truly shine um, it gives you the energy acceleration in the early game to make sure your damage output is up to par rather than just relying on one energy attachment per turn um, so those are pretty crucial for the strategy and then um, so are the experiencer. Um, whenever you, or whenever your opponent KOs the baby Veltal, or whenever he KOs, um, he or she KOs a uh, dark ride, experiencer makes sure that the energy stays in play. Therefore, even though you lose a Pokemon, your damage output is not decreased, which um, used to be an issue for the dark ride Giratina decks, where if um, Giratina got knocked out or something, like you really relied on those um, double dragon energy and experience here make sure that um, you don't have to you don't have to lose out on your damage output by attacking with Darkrai and letting it letting it fall and aside from that we have um, pretty standard choices two fighting fury belt the extra HP and the extra damage is pretty crude are pretty important I'd say as well um, to escape rope to get out of sticky situations and play around Jolteon EX or Rage Ice um, Rage Eye says Resistance Blizzard. Then you have one Enhanced Hammer for further disruption. One Enhanced and one Team for Grunt is also kind of becoming a little bit standard in some decks. Um, you have one Switch and one Float Stone, which is also pretty nice to retreat something like Hoop Array or something like that. Your Dark Rides will usually be powered up, so you don't really, you're not really afraid of them getting stuck in the active slot. And then finally you have the extra 10 um, damage off of reverse value which is also a decent counter to um, to parallel CD and things like rough seas um, having three stadiums is really good right now so that's the list um, I'm not sure what oops um, what Chris beat in order to reach the final and when well when he beat best because of striker which I would think is a really good matchup for for dark Ride because their damage output is decently low at the beginning of the game and you can probably expect to one hit KO Vespiquens um, every single turn or have enough damage output to one hit KO every single Pokemon in their deck every turn so if you can Lysander their Shaman or their Mew at some point or other and turn the price trade off even more in your favor 
Like I can see how that matchup must have been really good for Chris. Um, so yeah. That's the first place list. Like I mentioned, if you want to to check out the gameplay of this deck, um, definitely make sure to to check it out that check it out on the channel. And and yeah, let's move on to a second place deck, which is um, if this is pure consistency, then this upcoming deck is actually um, like very out of the norm. It doesn't really follow. Um, the rules of deck building that we are used to if you will and first off you have to realize this deck has 29 total pokemon okay look right there at the top um at the top tabs 29 pokemon that's almost or pretty much every one of or out of every two cards one of them is a pokemon and you only have four four vespiquins so everything else um serves a purpose but it can also become a dead card at some point in the game so it's a pretty bold move um it's one of the highest counts i've seen for a vespiquin deck it usually goes between 26 27 um so 29 definitely definitely um, pops out i would say and yeah um i mean it makes sense vespiquin deals 20 damage plus 10 more damage for each pokemon in your discard pile so you want as many of those pokemon in your discard pile as soon as possible but um dylan brian who got the second place um at athens um decided to use quite a variety of of tech choices if you will um he dropped down to two to substrika which i would say is a good metagame call because um because Iveltal was not that big in the tournament, or actually it wasn't big at all in the tournament. So going down to... Wow, I keep dropping things. Um, going down to a 2-2 line makes sense if you're not expecting as much Iveltal. Because Zepstrike is still a really good um, cheap way, if you will, early on to one-hit KO um, things like Shamans. And it ended up being a pretty good call in order to one-hit KO Mega Rayquaza. So I don't know if that was intentional or not. Uh, Mega Ray did make quite a big appearance um, at the tournament and it took three slots of the top eight and yeah I mean maybe he would have preferred to run the 3-3 but not for Veltal but rather um, Mega Ray and for the early KOs and Shaman. Either way um, so Striker was a really good call for the tournament. Um, after that we have a single Mew EX. Now Mew EX accomplishes many things in this, in this deck but mainly it gives you not only the psychic type in order to maybe sneak out an attack against an early Mega Mewtwo or something um, to get that one hit KO um, because you do have enough time to be able to Lysander KO the Garp so that your Mew is active or your Mew's ability is activated but um, since Regiice, Glacian, Jolteon actually made a decent enough appearance at the tournament um, having that basic attacker um, pretty much forced the the Regiice, Glacian, Jolton player to make sure that they always had Garbodor. So you would have to waste, or not waste, use up a ton of resources to make sure that every time they KO'd a Garbodor, you had the replacement Garbodor. Otherwise, Mew could have taken a shot and probably won a KO the Glacian. So... So that was one way to get out of the of the hard lock of Glacian that this deck suffers a little bit from. And and yeah, so that's Mew X. And then another thing that really pops out is the two Rattata. Now Rattata makes a lot of sense in the deck, I would say, because if you don't need it, you just discard it, right? But Rattata, once you play it down, it's essentially a plus 40 if you get to remove a Fighting Fury belt. Um, like early game you could potentially remove a spirit link from an active pokemon you could remove a float stone which maybe your opponent thinks your opponent thinks is pretty safe in the active slot or something like that you could even do lysander float stone or lysander ratata place to remove float stones as well after you ko garb so that's not um definitely not um <clears throat> um i don't know how often dylan might have done that but i can see that scenario being available to you quite often especially because you go through your deck pretty quickly with this um with the engine you use here with the acrobikes and the unknowns and things like that um 
So yeah, Ratata seems pretty helpful. I gave one Ratata to Dylan actually. The night before he asked me for a Ratata and I gave it to him, so that Ratata went all the way to second place. Um, now, so yeah, Ratata has a lot of benefits, not only in the early game, but also in the late game. I would say it opens up like a potential deck out scenario which you might not have expect expected or your opponent might not expect either. And then we also have a 3-2 Octillery line. With one Shaman EX, yes, but a 3-2 Octillery line, that's completely unheard of in today's format. And even in the previous format, like I used Octillery quite a lot during states, or rather during regionals last season with my Greninja. And the most I played was a 2-2 line, and for nationals I dropped to 2-1. So a heavy artillery line um, seems like a pretty good idea because not only does it make it easier to set up your artillery so that you start drawing cards early on, maybe before their Garbodor, um gets into play, but you also have those extra Pokemon after you've, you've set up your artillery in order to in order to to get the extra damage output, the, the extra damage output for Vespiquen. And finally. Um, like I mentioned, this deck, it's quite easy for them to spend resources to just KO Garb in a turn and that immediately activates your artillery once again because they're only giving up one prize card to do so, not two. So yeah, 3-2 um, three, artillery, three, artillery line in this deck seems pretty pretty genius, honestly, pretty genius. And then he has the 1-1 one, one Garb which to me seems a bit redundant. Um, you have a lot of abilities you do want to use in Octillery, in Shaman, in Mew, in Rattata, and maybe even some Striker, but also known and Klefki. And I don't think 1 1 is reliable, reliable enough to make sure you get it out every time against Greninja. So you would probably rather rely on speed against Greninja, but hey, um, he ran it, he got to second place, so um, not much I can say about that. Just not my personal. Like, I can see why it's in there, but. I would feel more comfortable maybe running a 2-1 instead of a 3-2 artillery, maybe a 2-2 with a 2-1 guard. That would make me a little bit more more happy, I would say, um, going into a, a 9, potentially 15, potentially 18 round tournament, or rather 17 round tournament. So yeah, um, that's the Pokemon, and as you can see, it's a, quite a big amount of Pokemon he ran there. And then the, the trainers are actually a lot simpler. It's also pretty much half the deck as he only runs four double colorless energy. But um, he runs four Sycamore, two N, and two Lysander. Now that's pretty standard because you do have the unknowns and the acrobikes and everything, four acrobikes. You really don't need that third N. It, it actually doesn't make that big a difference. Um, he did run a tech Olympia, which I'm guessing was for his artillery. Um, I don't know why you would use that instead of a second float stone, but I guess it, I mean, I don't see the healing ever being too crucial for this deck. Maybe it was, I generally wouldn't know. Um, I'll definitely be playing a little bit with this, um, with this list to try, uh, to try out different things and see why exactly um, the Olympia was there. Um, but yeah, that was his tech supporter of choice. And then he also had the four ultra ball, but only three versus seeker. Now that's also very, very um, peculiar, I would say. When was the last time you saw a deck with three versus seeker that was not called down on for not having four? Like ever since first seeker came out, I would say it's probably been a four off in every single deck I've seen. Every single deck, except Valplum, of course. But every other deck, four versus seeker are a given so yeah um, I mean running three you don't really lose too much on that and there's also mind games you could play with your opponent by only running three or rather that come into play when you're only running three because your opponent probably doesn't know like you would never assume your opponent only runs three versus seeker never ever 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 Unt unless you've actually seen your opponent's deck like his whole 60 cards like even if your opponent decks out and you only three and you only see three verse seeker in his discard pile you just assume the last verse seeker was priced there's absolutely no way 
you would not think that. So there's that mind game where you might be playing around a fourth verse seeker, a fourth potential verse seeker, which actually isn't there. So there's that mind game thing going on right there. Um, one lucky helmet seems pretty funny to me. Um, there was a lot of a lot of talk for um, for lucky helmet in Gyarados, like the week leading into regionals or the two weeks leading into regionals. So that's pretty funny, honestly, <laughs> to see to see the lucky helmet right there. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how useful it was or not. I guess it's an okay choice. Um, if you played late game, it can definitely help you against an N um, from your opponent. So if you played strategically, then it's probably a very decent play. Um, like if you're maxed out on acrobikes, if you don't want, if you're maxed out on sycamores and you're not running any trainer's mail, then why not slap in a, a lucky helmet right there? Um, you're not using anything else. Um, Vespiguan doesn't really benefit too much from other from other item cards, so why the heck not? Um, and then we have the one faded town that plus his stadium of choice um, makes sense for the megas. It's like a plus twenty plus power if you play it strategically, as I've mentioned. Um, but with so much discarding um, going on with the deck, I don't know how feasible it is to actually rely on having that faded town in the late game or in the middle stages of the game when you need it before you end up discarding because one stadium will obviously not win you the stadium war against pretty much any deck so yeah um then we have one buddy buddy rescue which um, makes sense to maybe get back immediately a vespiquen to maybe get back a shaman maybe get back mew and one revitalizer to play to potentially have a fifth vespiquen line going so um Buddy Buddy Rescue is, I would say, unheard of in this deck. You would expect Supra to be in there, but I can see why the immediate going back to your hand is more appealing than the shuffling back three into the deck. And then the two special charge, because obviously you only have two, two or rather four special energy to attack with. So um, you want those in there. Now, or you want to recycle them so that you actually get to attack six times if you if the four Vespiquen do get KO'd, or if maybe through a Sycamore or something you do lose a, a DT. Um, no Ranger, which I'm sure many people are saying, oh, but Giratina um, will just run through their deck, through this deck, and yes, you are completely right. There's absolutely no way to, go, to get around Giratina, just no, absolutely no way. So you might as well take the loss to Giratina, which is actually pretty pretty much not seen at all in this meta game at the moment um, even though Megas did make kind of a resurgence and Mega Ray might justify playing Giratina again because locking a parallel CD is actually pretty detrimental for Mega Ray but um, you just take that loss like not even a, a one Ranger will will change that matchup for you so you might as well just avoid the Ranger there's a there's a reason to play Ranger in the Glacian decks that popped up at Athens and that I'm sure we'll start seeing a lot more play now that they're out in the open but but there's definitely no um, no other no like the main reason to play Ranger would be that deck not Giratina because you're not gonna beat Giratina um, under normal circumstances so yeah that's Dylan Bryant's second place list which I as you can see took quite a bit of time to talk about and then we are going to review a Mega Ray deck now that was like those were the three archetypes that made um, Top Cut at Athens, Mega Ray, all eight decks were a combination of Mega Ray, Turbo Dark, and Vesta Concept Strika. So I'm gonna take a look at Ahmed's um, fifth place list, but I will, I just want to mention one thing. I don't have any Magyarna promo in this account, so disregard the two Magyarna EXs. One is a Magyarna EX, but the other one is um, or would be the promo Magyarna, which does have 90 HP and has a single metal energy attack which deals 20 damage for every different type of Pokemon your opponent has on their bench. So a good Rainbow Road measure, a good non-EX attacker, definitely good against um, the Vespiquen Regi Glacian Jolton decks that popped up as along with the regular Magyarna and you also have Girachi, Girachi in there so and a nice variety of attackers, aside from the overwhelming power of Mega Ray. Um, 
Mega Ray, of course, um, 220 HP, pretty good for the um, for the Megas. Um, that's actually a, a magic number, I would say. 210 HP is not an amount you want to have. 220 is the bare minimum you want on a Mega right now, based on the meta game. And Emerald Break is just um, a really good attack. I mean, you can potentially one hit KO absolutely anything that stands in your way. So in order to support that, um, Ahmed runs a very similar support line of Pokemon as Mega Gardevoir does. Um, four Jirachi, I mean not four Jirachi, four Shamini X and two Hoopa, and a single Dragonite. Now the single Dragonite makes sense because you're not actually actively discarding Pokemon like Mega Guardi does, so you don't need to get them back right away. Um, there's also like the advantage of Mega Guardi is the fact that you can recycle Shamans more easily, whereas this deck, once they're down, they're down and you're probably not gonna play them back or get them back um, in a while. Although, Ahmed does play uh, Body Body Rescue, which once again is uh, a card that really shone this weekend and a super odd, so that makes sense. Um, now, energy, just 4 DC and 5 metal energy, nothing really too out of the norm right there. Um, I know one of the other Mega Rays, like there were two metal Mega Rays, such as this one, and then Cheap Reach list, um, list was Mega Ray Jolteon, so that was different. I would say in that top cut, the Jolteon might have made a big difference against the Turbo Darks, but um, like definitely a hindrance to not have Jirachi. I'm not sure if he ran Jirachi, but definitely a hindrance to not run Jirachi against the Vespiquen decks because. Even though it's a bad matchup for you, it might have helped you turn the tables around in a weird game, I don't know. Um, but yeah, the the supporters is what you would expect from a 4 Shaman 3 or 4 Shaman 2, 2 Hoopa deck. Um, you have the 3 Sycamore which are pretty key, and then you have 1 N, 1 Lysander, 1 Hex Maniac, and 1 Skyla. Now, once I was at like during the tournament, I I honestly had underestimated Skyla, especially in decks such as this one and Mega Gardevoir. Skyla becomes an Ultra Ball, and an Ultra Ball immediately becomes set up, okay, through Hoopa. Um, Skyla is a pretty broken card in those two decks. Like, I'm surprised, or any deck that runs Hoopa actually, like Mega Mewtwo, Mega, any Mega deck that runs Mew, uh, Hoopa, even Turbo Dark. I think many decks would actually benefit from running the one Skyland. It's something I'm definitely going to be trying out um, myself in the near future and in my tournament list because I I was generally um, surprised. Like even Volcanion could use a Skyla um, because it has that utility on turn one to find the Ultra Ball, but it also has utility throughout the whole game to find a Spirit Link, to find a Mega Turbo, to find a Floatstone to find an escape rope instead of having to sycamore for it and hoping to get it you can actually skyla for it and in a bad situation you can skyla for sycamore too so i generally think skyla deserves a lot more a lot more play than it's getting so huge props to ahmed for for running that um and yeah um with all the acceleration off of shaman the thin supporter lines make sense um, a turn 1 Hex would definitely hurt this deck quite a bit, also Garbodor hurts this deck quite a bit, but as you can see, the top decks, none of them had Garbodor, and um, if Turbo Dark was pretty big without Garbodor, um, you also had Greninja, which doesn't run Garbodor, I mean it does have um, Shadow Stitching, which prevents ability, but that prevents abilities but that takes a while to set up and Mega Raid doesn't have that much trouble when it's killing Greninjas or Greninja Breaks um, so it's not too relevant and then you have the Mega decks such as Mega Gardevoir which scared off all the Mega Mewtwo's and then it doesn't run Garbodor itself either so you um, this deck really shown and it was a great metagame call for the weekend um, for Mega Turbos for recovery and speed for Ultra Ball, for Trainer's Mail, for Verseeker, all for consistency. Um, one Escape Rope, I would love two in this, but one is okay. Um, two Floatstone to retreat those Hoopas and those Dragonites with their heavy retreats. Three Spirit Link, because sometimes or many games you can actually just, like, if you're not gonna take a turn one KO, which is not that common, um, you can afford to evolve your first Rayquaza with no Spirit Link and therefore save the other Spirit Links for the other Mega Rays. 
Um, you also run a 3-3 line rather than 4-3 or 4-4, so 3 is just enough for the Pokemon you run. And and yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I think expanded lists are even down to 2 mega or to 2 Spirit Links because that saves you a lot of um, a lot of space. And yeah, that's Ahmed's list. Um, I believe he was first seed going into top 8, so he probably lost to one of the Vespicons of Strika. He placed 5th in the tournament. Um, that's his second top 8. He top eight, He got top 8 at Fort Wayne, and then he got top 8 at, at Athens too. Um, so not doing bad for himself right there. Um, he's mostly known as a Vulcanian player, but he decided to switch things up. Um, still playing Skyfield, uh, Skyfield deck, I guess. Um, he must be really comfortable with that. But yeah, um, huge props to him for running this deck and doing well with it. Um, so yeah, another deck I want to talk about before I talk about my my list, although the video is now um, becoming quite long, um, the Athens Greninja list. Now this was a list piloted by Jimmy Pendarvis and Bradley Crucio. Um, Bradley got 11th place and Jimmy Pendarvis got um, top 32 he didn't have that um, that good at day 2 as Brad did and yeah I mean so far off of Greninja at regionals we've seen Greninja with Talonflame Greninja with no Talonflame Greninja with Force Splash Greninja with Beedrill Greninja and Talonflame um, and now we see Greninja with absolutely nothing else this is just Pure Greninja 4443 line. Now, I played this deck the other day in my stream. Um, I definitely don't have, um, I would say, the luck <laughs> to run a list such as this one. Um, pricing issues, not drawing into the super odds, your opponent playing around the bursting balloons, 12 of Lysanders. Um, I don't know, it's personally not my favorite Greninja list, um, it's obviously a good one based on the results they got, um, combined especially, it's really it's a really impressive showing. Um, I'm still a Talonflame believer now, I used to not be a Talonflame believer, um, I actually haven't played Talonflame Greninja in a tournament, um, bigger than a league challenge, <coughs> but I still prefer Talonflame. But the repeat balls here is something that really stood out to me because repeat ball serves two functions and I believe you could argue that repeat ball and level ball both have their pros and cons. Um, I've run lists such as this one with level ball instead of repeat ball. Repeat ball is better in the late game, like if you draw them in the late game they can find you Greninja and they can find you Greninja break. But if you draw two Froakies and a repeat ball you're going to be kicking yourself because you don't have a way to find the frog here. So I'm not entirely sold on the repeat ball business. Um, I feel like the level ball is um, just a little bit better than repeat ball in my personal opinion. Um, re um, level ball also gets better if you start running things like Jirachi or even Octillery. Um, we could be seeing Octillery come back into play at some point um, but yeah that's like the most um, outstanding card off of the list here um, two max potion is now pretty standard three bursting balloons you would love to run four but you really don't have the space and the rest is pretty standard I mean they did run ranger mostly for mirror but they had the added benefit to have a counter to the Jolteon decks although they are not dealing too much damage anyways so it wasn't that important it was mostly for mirror and then they also run, instead of 3N and 1 Ace Trainer, they're running 4N and 2 Ace Trainer. Um, that makes sense with all the extra space they do have off of not running Talonflame. Um, if you wanted to run Talonflame here, you could drop 1N, 1 Ace Trainer, 1 Froakie, and I don't know, probably 1 Level Ball, or 1 Repeat Ball, sorry. And there's your 4 Talonflame, and the list still plays out pretty much the same. Um, you would maybe want an extra basic energy or play a 7-2 line instead of a 6-3 to, uh, to make sure you have the energy for... or to try, and, to try and guarantee the energy for Talonflame, but other than that, you could play this exact same list. And now Greninjas are pretty much forced to run Silent Lab, 
based on the fact that Giratina prone was out and it prevents um, breaks from using abilities. It might as well say, as long as this Pokemon isn't on your bench, um, Greninja Break can't use Giant Water Shuriken because that's pretty much the only purpose it's serving currently. Um, but yeah, since Giratina promo is a thing, unless you're certain that in your metagame there won't be any Giratina, you definitely need to run Silent Lab. Um, three pretty much guarantees Giratina will not be a problem, two is the bare minimum you can run. Um, I don't know if they faced off against any Giratina promo containing decks. Um, I know Chip's deck had Giratina, I believe, um, the top 8 Mega Ray Jolteon deck. I believe did have one Giratina promo, so that's... Um, might have helped them there, but even then, Mega Ray is probably not that good a matchup for for this deck. So um, that's Greninja. That's the new Greninja, if you will. It seems like every tournament we have a new Greninja popping out. <laughs> and I just wanted to mention or talk about the important points, such as the Rangers, such as the supporter counts, the Silent Lab, and the Repeat Bolts. And then we finally have the deck I ran. Um, Grant Manley took this deck to 10th place not the exact same list we had a few difference his was less a lot less teched out a lot more consistent that might have been the difference between our our results um he still only ran two glacian so that pricing to glacian against Greninja would have still happened no matter what list i ran um and yeah as you can tell that really stuck with me because the original lists that got top 16 at dallas that got top 32 and things like that they were only running one glacian so and they were beating Greninja that way. So I put in two Glacian purposely to make sure I don't have pricing issues. And I put in two of each attacker just for that. And what happens? I prize the two Glacian against Greninja. Um anyways. So this is the list. Um two to two of the attackers, two Jolton, two Regis, which were the main ones, and two Glacian. Um Glacian ended up being Unadvertently important because um, Mega Ray was so popular and Vespiquen Valplume or no, Vespiquen Substrika was so popular. I actually faced off two of those in my rounds along with two Greninjas. So Glacian ended up or might have been the MVP of the tournament. Um, a 3 2 Garbodor line because you rely a lot on shutting down Greninja once again and probably Fright Knight, so that's why setting up Garbodor is so important. Grant ran a 3 3 line, so that's how important Garbodor is for this deck to actually function properly. And 2 Shaman. Um, aside from that, it's pretty much all consistency. The energy count seems weird. I have 5 Lightning Energy and 4 Water Energy, even though I have 4 Water type attacking Pokemon. And only two lightning type attacking Pokemon. Um, honestly, the energy was not an issue. Um, Grant ran five and five, which is more, once again more consistent. Um, but throughout all nine rounds, I don't think I ever ran into any issues with my energy. Um, it's a very thin, it's like the bare minimum. You could swap out the lightning for the water, that's fair enough. Um, I just figure that. In any matchup where Jolteon is needed, it's pretty much Jolteon or nothing. Such as Eveltal or such as um, Turbo Dark because they do have the baby Eveltal. But in every other matchup where you need either Regice or Glacian, um, you can maybe afford to start attacking with Jolteon or you can afford to take that, those extra turns to power up um, the water type attacker. So that was why um, there's definitely an argument to play 5-5. Ross Cawthon also played this deck and he ran the 5-5-4 energy line. So there's a whole lot of ways you can run this. Um, the most consistent is obviously 5-5-4. Um, then I had the 4-3-2 Sycamore and Lysander, which is pretty standard, and my tech supporter of choice was Giovanni's. Um, that extra 20 damage surprised so many people throughout the tournament. Like, I cannot even begin how many people I surprised with that. Um, yeah, pretty important. Giovanni was pretty important. Not only for the early game consistency it added to the deck because you had an extra out to drawing cards, but that extra 20 damage was actually something a lot of opponents either didn't account for, even though the Giovanni wasn't in the discard pile, or they were simply not expecting. Um, they wouldn't expect their Hoopa, their 80 damaged Hoopa to get 2 hit KO'd. They wouldn't expect their 80 damaged Dragon IDX to get 2 hit KO'd. And yeah, that allowed. Um, that allowed for some really nice plays. 
um, three rough seas because we really fear the Veltal, but now I realize rough seas was like this deck doesn't really benefit from any stadium at all and Grant did not run any stadium at all so yeah I mean a lot of decks or a lot of I wouldn't feel comfortable not running any stadiums um, I had parallel city original here thanks to long who did that who did make top cut with this deck as well um, I then switched to rough seas I also considered parallel um, ended up running a high count of rough seas but I don't think it was the best call for the for the day and then um, three floatstone Grant ran four in order to guarantee the carp and to Fighting Fury Belt, Grant ran zero. Um, the Fighting Fury Belt was honestly, now that I realize, like super fancy play syndrome, if you will. Um, that extra 10 damage is nice, but it's not necessary. Um, because you want to have a lock. You don't want your, your Pokemon to take hits or get 2 hit KO'd, or rather 3 hit KO'd instead of 2 hit KO'd. You want your opponent to never be able to attack you by using the right attacker. So, finding view belt seems seems rather um, redundant at this point in time. And yeah, I mean everything else was consistency. Max Elixir, Verse Seeker, Trouble Trainers may all super odd. Um, nothing much to add to that. If I were to play this deck again, um, I would definitely play the Grant version of the deck, the simplified version, the extra attackers and everything. Um, this deck is a very delicate deck to consider playing because if people know you're going to play it, they can just play one ranger in their deck and probably run you over. But if you're not expecting ranger in any decks or in your local metagame, then this is a pretty strong, um, a pretty strong deck. Um, so it kind of goes like, do people expect this deck and therefore play ranger? So it's not a good choice, but then people stop playing ranger because this deck isn't getting played because people are playing rangers so they take out the ranger for other cards and therefore you can once again consider playing this because there's less ranger um throughout the tournament out of nine rounds i only played um two decks that had ranger one was greninja um, i played chris shamansky who was using greninja probably a list very similar to to the arg one i showed off although he did have talonflame i believe and then um you also have um, I also played against a Pidgeot, Jolteon, um, Lugia deck that had Ranger. Like, I never expected the Ranger right there. If in game one I hadn't lost two prize cards to an early Shaman, like to the Shaman I started off with and he went first, um, I believe I, even though, even with Ranger, I could have outlasted his Rangers and thanks to Rough Seas, I could have potential heal. And that's exactly what happened in game two. I was able to deck him out by outlasting his Rangers and his Lysanders. Um, but then there was no time for game three and it ended up being a tie. But that Ranger on game one could have easily made that deck into, or could have easily made that tie into a loss, like for sure. Um, but anyways guys, that's Athens Regionals, that's my review for Athens Regionals, I hope you guys enjoyed, it's a lot longer than Dallas, definitely, a lot, a lot longer than the Dallas review, um, I don't know when I'll be uploading this, probably throughout the weekend, um, Saturday, maybe Sunday, I don't know, uh, maybe Monday, maybe I'll wait until Monday, um, uh, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed, um, I do like doing this, like, more relaxed deck reviews and talking about the meta game and the lists and the peculiarities of each um, instead of just playing games outright and I am a little bit Pokemon out as you guys might have seen on the stream so so I'm actually glad to do something different and yeah that's gonna be it for me guys please leave a like on the video to support the channel it really helps out um, check out our sponsors CCG Castle if you want to purchase any cards they have great prices I guarantee that and Ultimate Guard, Pokemix, Patreon, if you want to support the channel even more than you already do by watching this, by staying all 40, almost 45 minutes here, um, listening to me talk. And yeah, thank you so much, guys. I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.